first car that I purchased um, out of college was a uh, white Toyota Corolla. And uh, I named her Anna Marie. And so Anna Marie lasted for about 200,000 miles. And then uh, I sold her. I sold her. I don't know where she is now. Uh, and since that time, I've actually purchased several uh, Toyota cars. Um, but one thing that I can't figure out, maybe you can, one thing I can't really figure out in a lot of my cars are the warning lights. If you had them, they pop up, and it's never pleasant when you see one of those warning lights pop up, and you're thinking, oh, great. You know, what's wrong with my car? Is it going to work? And panic spreads in, and fear spreads in. And I mean, you can, you know, you can open up your manual and you can figure out what it means. I mean, usually, you know, I know in my manual that I'm currently, you know, driving, it's page 78, I can look them up. <laughs> but, but here's the problem for me. Um, several times, I've had warning lights pop up onto my dashboard. I've taken it in to the mechanic like a good person does, I guess. Um, and they tell me nothing's wrong with the car. They say that the sensor tripped. And so it's a false signal, basically. And then they tell me, the worst news, that to reset it so it doesn't appear on the dashboard, it's like 60 or 70 bucks. Yeah. And I'm thinking, this is terrible. So currently, if you go out to the parking lot and you look at my car and turn it on, there's a, a light on the dashboard, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Except the gas one. When the gas light comes on, I usually you know, pay attention to it. I know I've got like 40 miles to go. Um, but I just simply don't trust these lights. I, mean, that's, I, I don't know if it's wrong or right, but that's my philosophy of warning lights. Uh, that's kind of where I, I've landed about these warning lights. So take that philosophy and it kind of got tested a couple weeks ago. Uh, I was driving Hannah to, to school and uh, we got in the car and there it is, warning light, you know, low tire pressure. So I did what I do and I ignored it. <laughs> and then I started to get out the driveway and I immediately noticed the car wasn't, it didn't feel right. So I got out and yeah, there was a flat tire. So in that case, the, the warning light actually, you know, it did. It, it told the truth. And so all that to say, my philosophy is not rock solid. It's, <laughs> it's not bulletproof. But what about you? Do you uh, pay attention to the warning lights? Do you pay attention to the warning signs? Uh, today, Jesus is going to tell us and he's going to tell the disciples about the warning signs for the end of the age, for the end of humanity as we know it. And Jesus will tell us today in this passage, these are the warning signs to look out for. When you see this happening, then you know that the end is near. And you know there's going to be great tribulation. And so Jesus in this passage is telling us and uh, telling um, the disciples basically the future. And, and you know, in this day and age as Christians, we a lot of times use a lot of uh, phrases about the end times. Uh, you'll hear us say, you know, it's a sign of the times. It's a sign of the times. We'll say that phrase a lot. Or we'll say, you know what, I think we're in the end times. I, I think we're in the last days. Especially if you watch the news, you definitely think that we're in the last days. Or you say, you know, I hope the Lord comes back because things are just getting so bad on, on earth. I mean, the times, they're just getting worse worse and, and worse. And so that's kind of the golden question is, are we living in the end times right now? 
How many of you think we're living in the end times? I'm just curious. How many don't think we're living in the end times? Okay. Um, you know, it's hard. You, you look at what's happening in the world. I mean, there's a big, really, conflict between Islam and the West and Islam and Christianity. There are Christians that are being persecuted in, in different places in the world. There are a lot of natural disasters like hurricanes. Um, there are, you know, even when you think of COVID, uh, when, when COVID was happening, you really started to think about the end times and, and you know, prophecies and, and wow, what, you know, what about if someone comes and has the vaccine and, and you start thinking about all this, uh, these things. And I would say this, it is very much among Christians open for debate whether we're in the end times, you know, we get caught up in when it's going to be in the time and, and all those things. I can say for certain that we're trending in that direction. We're, we're trending in that direction. But it's definitely something that, for me, I hold with an open hand, not a closed uh, fist. Um, we're going to continue on in the Gospel of Mark this week. Uh, we're going to take the next three weeks and look at Mark. 13, 1 to 37. Uh, it's a road map of what will happen in the future. Jesus is telling what is going to happen in the future over 2,000 years ago. And today we're going to look specifically at Mark 13, 1 to 13, where Jesus shares the signs of the end of the age. Now a little bit of background about this, so a little bit about the, the setting. This is taking place on Wednesday of, um, of Passion Week. So these are the, the last seven days of Jesus' life on earth. He, he's going to die and resurrect during this week. And this is Wednesday of that week. And at this time, Jesus' public ministry is finished. He's not doing anything you know, publicly uh, anymore. Um, he's talking specifically now to the disciples in the next couple days. And then uh, Thursday, it will be Passover. They will celebrate the Lord's Supper. He will get arrested that night. Friday, he will be crucified. And Sunday, uh, he will resurrect. So now in these last day or so of Passion Week, he kind of turns his attention from the crowd and from teaching and public ministry to his disciples. And he kind of gives them, you know, kind of a, a last will and, and testament, kind of a you know, these are the things that you can expect will happen. And, and this passage is known as the Olivet Discourse. Uh, the Olivet Discourse. It's also recorded in Matthew 24 and 25 in more detail and also in Luke 21. And so at this time, Jesus and his disciples, for most of the Olivet Discourse, he is uh, on the Mount of Olives. And, and for the most Part of this, Jesus is talking about the future. He's going to talk about what's going to happen. And, and you can kind of see that they're on this mountain, but in the distance, they can see the temple. Uh, they can see the, the Jewish uh, temple. And I just want to say something uh, you know, about this. The entire Olivet Discourse, uh, it talks about the future. It talks about three different distinct Time periods. And these time periods are from between the first coming of Jesus, which we're talking about in Mark, and the second coming of Jesus, which will be in the future. That hasn't happened yet. And that's the period of time that we live in, between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And there's three distinct time periods. One is a time of general trouble, and that's what we're going to talk about today, a time of general trouble. That's the time that we're in right now, and that's verses 1 to 13. The second is the great tribulation. It's called the great tribulation, and that's basically when things get really bad, and that is verses 14 to 23 in chapter 13. And then verses 24 to 37 are his future second coming, and we're going to tackle each one of these in the next three weeks. But this teaching, just for you to understand, this teaching for, from Jesus, for the disciples, is very shocking. It's very, very surprising. 
surprising for the disciples. That what Jesus is saying. I, I would say it's even disturbing to the disciples. And, and why? Because it wasn't what they expected. They believed that he was the Messiah. They thought that he would be their king. Probably in the next couple weeks he would become king. And, I mean, they had read all the Old Testament prophecies. It says in Isaiah 9, you know, the government uh, should be on his shoulder. And they thought, yeah, Jesus is going to be king. He's going to overthrow the Romans. This is going to happen soon. They can't wait. They can't wait until the kingdom is going to be built. And so they thought... Everything would come to fruition soon, maybe in the next you know, couple weeks, and, and that Jesus would be king. And so they're really excited. I, I mean, they think that the kingdom is going to get set up, and they'll probably be you know, in power. And, and so they're really excited about this messianic kingdom that they envision in their heads. So their expectations are in one place. Well, this passage for the disciples is... Jesus hitting the pause button. It's Jesus hitting the pause button. I mean, he's saying, time out. Time out. This is what's going to happen. And, and I actually can't imagine how hard it was for the disciples to hear this. Uh, I think it really you know, disturbed uh, them. And so this passage is prophetic. It tells the future. Uh, this passage is uh, predictive. It predicts the future. And uh, again, this passage is no surprise to God, but it's a surprise to the disciples. And, and that's the thing with human history. Human history is no surprise to God, but sometimes it's surprising to us. And, but we have to remember that God is writing human history and not us. God's writing human history and not us. So let's start with Mark 13, verses 1 to 2. Uh, Jesus talks about the temple. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. The temple, this is it right here, was a beautiful building. It was magnificent. <clears throat> King Herod had built it. They had built it for 80 years. It was always being updated. It was overlaid with gold. I mean, this had a lot of money, you know, put into it. And the disciples see how beautiful it is. And they're saying, look, you know, this is such an incredible, you know, work of art. And it's just so beautiful. And then Jesus kind of shocks them, and he says, you know what? It's going to get knocked down. It's going to, all of it's going to be gone. It's going to get knocked down. And guess what? It does. Four years later, in AD 70, the Romans destroy Jerusalem. They kill a million Jews. The gold in the temple is melted by the fire. There's a huge fire, and it burns down. And it, the gold in the temple is melted in the fire, and it runs down in between the cracks in the stones. And as people later, they would come and search for the gold, they toppled every stone in its place. The only stones that were left undisturbed were the foundational stones of the temple. And guess what? It's never, ever been built again. It's never been built. Now, some people are proposing that they build the third temple. There's a lot of people that want to, want to do that. Uh, but the temple has never been built uh, again. And so here it is. Jesus predicts something, and it comes true. See, that's what we got to understand about the Bible. The Bible always corresponds to reality. The Bible always corresponds to reality. What it promises will happen, will happen. What Jesus predicts will happen, will happen. He says the truth. The Bible always corresponds to reality. It becomes true. And so in Mark 13, 3 to 5, uh, they, they move locations. They go to the Mount of Olives. And, and he says this, And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, 
Peter and James and John and Andrew, those are the two sets of brothers, asked him privately, tell us, you know, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? You know, give us a sign, Jesus. And Jesus began to say to them, see to it, no one leads you astray. So Jesus and the disciples moved to the Mount of Olives. The disciples thought Jesus, that he's going to usher in a new kingdom, uh, you know, at any time or at least by the end of the Passover season. And they're looking for a sign. They're like, Jesus, what do we look for? That, you know, the, the kingdom is going to come. And, you know, when is it going to start? They're really anxious. And instead, Jesus says, you know, see to it that no one leads you astray, guys. See to it that no one diverts your, your attention. Jesus basically here is turning on the warning lights. He's turning on the warning lights for the disciples. He's trying to pre prepare them, and he's trying to prepare us now. He gives us the, the warning lights. And a lot of times in, when you read you know, Daniel and Revelation and you read this passage, in Matthew 24 and 25 especially, sometimes it's hard to tell what age he's talking about. Was he talking about, you know, the disciples' age? Is he talking about now? And, um, you know, a lot of that we'll be able to figure out for sure when we get to heaven. Some of it's a little hard to, to interpret. Um, but we can take definitive things uh, from it. But he says, when you see these things happen will be a, a sign. So the first warning, the signs of the end times, the signs that we are near the, the great tribulation is, the first one is that false prophets will rise. Verse Mark 13, 6. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Many false prophets, teachers, will come claiming to be the Messiah or some kind of deliverer that is going to offer, you know, some kind of solution for the world's problems. I, I thought about this a lot when we were going through COVID. You know, someone comes and, and they have the vaccine and, you know, they're, they're going to be, you know, into power. And, and I think with COVID, it really got us thinking a lot about, you know, the end times and Antichrist and, and those kind of things. But some false prophets will even claim to be Jesus himself. They'll say, I'm the Messiah. I'm, you know, Jesus. And so this will increase as the end times <coughs> near. And there will be wholesale deception. Wholesale deception. Spiritual frauds will come. Wolves in sheep's clothing will come. People will be misled, they will be, they will be led astray, and they will sound good, but they won't be. They will sound like they're doing something good, but they won't be good. They will be wolves in sheep's clothing. They will be, they will be deceivers, deceivers. You know, we've had this in, in history, right? How many of you remember Jim Jones? What did he do? I mean, he led 900 people to some compound. He told them to drink the Kool-Aid, and he killed 900 people, deceptively claiming things. You know, God told him this, and God told him that. And then you have things like David Koresh. I mean, people that thought, no, I'm the Messiah, or I'm some, you know. And, and then you have, you know, people like Joseph Smith misleading people. You have people like Muhammad who has misled People. And they're all deceivers. They're all deceivers. And, and, and let me just say, with deception, false religions are the worst of the deceivers in a lot of ways because they're masquerading as angels of light. False religions are close, but they're masquerading as angels of light, and they're deceiving billions of people. Billions of people are led through false religions. I mean, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, the problem is they're sending people straight to hell because they don't have Jesus. And, and again, it's deception. It's deception. And that's what will happen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4 warns us of this. It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have
having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Well, that can happen very easily once we steer away from the Bible, once we steer away from the truth of God's word. And we start going into myths and we start going into philosophy and we start, and then everything, it's a slippery slope. And that can happen uh, very easily. The second warning is nation will rise against other nation. Mark 13, 7 to 8. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. These are about the beginning of the birth pain, pains. You know, we do live on a very uh, dangerous planet. I mean, you think about it. You read the news, and we live on a dangerous planet. There's wars, there's nuclear bombs, there's shootings, there's crime, there's pandemics, there's disease, and, and then you look at the natural disasters. There's hurricanes and tsunamis and famines and fires and, and floods. I mean, think about the wars. There's always a war going on. Right now it's in Russia, in Ukraine. I mean, think of the, the country of Israel. Israel is always surrounded by war. There's always a threat of war when you live in Israel. I mean, think about Islam in the West. You just have a, a conflict waiting to happen. Or, or you think of China. I mean, what if China attacks? I mean, we're, there's, the world is never really at, at peace. There's always a, a threat of war. Um, and, and you think of nuclear war. I mean, you've got countries like the United States, and, and you've got countries like Russia and, and China and the United Kingdom and Israel and India and Pakistan and North Korea. They all have nuclear weapons. And you get some crazy person behind that, you know, they can push that button, and, and who knows what happens. And, and some countries... You know, they're, they're toying around with biological weapons, which is even scarier. So there's always that looming over us, that threat of, of war. And there will also be natural disasters. That's the third thing. Earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, wildfires, you know, floods, or, or even plagues and pandemics. You know, in the 1300s in Europe, they had what was called the Black Death. Uh, it was brought in by rats. It killed 60% of the population. Um, that happened, and they probably thought it was, it was the end times. But the earth is a, is a dangerous place. Now, it does seem that there's a lot more natural disasters. It does seem that it's trending you know, in that direction. This is a California newspaper that wrote about wildfires in California. It says this, if it seems that wildfires are burning nearly all the time these days, that there's no longer a def definable fire season in California, you're right. 14 of the 20 most destructive fires in California's history have occurred since 2007. And California has 78 more annual fire days than it did 50 years ago. When 2018 became the worst fire year ever recorded, on record, we recognized a new reality. Now each year, it surpassed that list, or that last one, setting records for size, destruction, cost, and loss of life. Is it a coincidence? Well, you know, I think we're trending again in that direction. It's hard to say these are the end days, but we're definitely trending in that uh, direction. In other words, things are falling into place as Jesus said that they, that they would. And Jesus warns us here that these are the beginning of birth pains. You know, the pain that a woman experiences in childbirth. Birth pain, you know, birth pains signal uh, the end of the pregnancy is near. You know, and they, they start infrequently and then they increase until that child is born. Well, the signs talked about in verses 6 to 8 will be infrequent and then... They will increase until the time of the Great Tribulation. So these are just the beginning. These are just the contractions. I always feel weird talking about birth and contractions. Like, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, maybe. 
basically I was just a cheerleader, you know, at the event. But anyway, um, are we in the end times? I mean, you can see that the writing's on the wall. You can see these things are happening more and more. I would say, yeah, things are falling into a place. I don't think we need to you know, say it's going to happen on this day. There's some guys, they get up there and make billboards, and they're like, it's going to happen in September 2022 on a fall day, you know, and it's, it never happens. Now, when you start looking at all this, I would say it, it, it's kind of dark. You know, it, it's kind of uh, pessimistic, you know, if you will. Um, you know, doom and gloom, it's the end of the world. I mean, even as I was studying this week, I'm like, this is going to be dark. Like, I need something cheerful and joyful. Uh, but yeah, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. But here's the thing, you know, yeah, it, it, there is going to be an end of the world. And, and yes, Jesus is going to return, so we can look forward to that. Jesus did tell us these things to get us real anxious. Jesus didn't tell us these things to, uh, you know, make us live in fear all the time. He didn't. He didn't say this so that we would just sit and worry uh, about what's coming. Um, and we know that Jesus is coming back. We have great hope. And, and again, we know Him. We have a relationship with Him. You know, at verse seven it says, "And when you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. This must take place." But the end is not yet. He, he says, don't be alarmed. You, you know, don't be surprised. Uh, don't be caught off guard. Don't let it concern you. You know, be alert. But, um, you know, it's going to come. It, you know, for me, it's kind of like the warning light in my car. You can, it's on, but okay. It's going to happen. You know, whatever happens. Jesus was instructing us to not allow wars, natural disasters, or persecution, or rumors of war to alarm or concern us because the end is not yet. These are birth pains. These are going to happen. And, you know, it's going to be infrequent at first, and then it's going to keep, you know, increasing uh, as we get closer to Jesus' return. Now, the flip side of all that, too, is there are groups of people, post-millennialists, who believe that the world will get better and better and better. That's their philosophy, that everything will keep getting better and better and better and, and better. Um, I don't see that. Um, human experience teaches us that, that, no, it's not getting better and better. It's going to get worse and, and worse and, and worse. If you think of just morality, the, the moral slide that we've had in 20 years, I mean, the last 20 years, what's happened morally, it's unbelievable how much you know, we've gone down. I mean, people are now, they're identifying as animals. Seriously, they're called furries. I identify as an animal. I mean, really, what's next? Oh, I identify as a pedophile. I mean, really, you could, it's a slippery slope. Once you start going down it, it's just going to get more and, and more, you know, just decrepit. It's terrible. The fourth thing is that persecution will uh, come. Mark 13, verse 9, and verse 11 and 13. But be on your guard. So yeah, they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And, and when they bring you to a trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you're to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father is child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So Jesus says, yeah, be on your guard. Don't be alarmed when people persecute you. And this might happen if you're a Christian. Um, and what's interesting here, or maybe even confusing, is Jesus here is talking about Jewish persecution. You know, they always had a, a council. They always had a court right next to the synagogue. If you were guilty, you would be tried in that court. 
and you would be given 39 lashes. It happened to Paul a lot of times. He was given 39, you know, brutal lashes for blast what they said was blaspheming God. He would get whipped. And so it, it comes from the Jewish people, you know, and it will come from others too. Remember this about the disciples. 11 out of the 12 disciples, according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, are martyred. Um, they're, they're killed. They're speared. They're, they're crucified upside down. Uh, um, they're all, all, kinds of, all kinds of things beheaded. Uh, the disciples would be hated because of Jesus. And that happens. It, it, it does happen, you know, right in the future there. John 15, 18 says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And this happens to the disciples. They're hated because they love Jesus and want people to know Jesus. But guess what? It, it happens to Jesus, too. I mean, in two days from this passage, he's going to be crucified by the Jewish people. And so in these situations of persecution, he reminds them, you know, the Spirit of God is, is going to be with you. He'll, he'll tell you what to do in those moments. He'll be with you in those moments. The Holy Spirit will, will guide you. So yes, it is going to get worse and worse for Christians. There will be persecution. I think we can kind of see that trend, um, you know, so to speak. But in some places in the world, they're already there. They're already, the persecution's heavy, places like North Korea, places like Saudi Arabia. And, and I, I understand this from hearing stories about communism. You know, communism, you couldn't believe in God, really. But I heard a lot of people's stories who, who lived in it when we lived in Czech Republic. And, and they will say that persecution can divide families. It can really divide families. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. They're persecuted if they don't do something. Some of them want to do it. Some just say, no, we're going to stand with Christ. And, and here's the thing, too, about persecution is when you look at persecution around the world, false religions massacre Christianity. False religions massacre Christianity. A lot of the persecution that we have today come from false religions against Christianity. They're territorial, they're, they're intolerant, they're against Jesus, and you can see that. They're persecuting Christians. Try to be a Christian in, in a you know, Sharia law Muslim country. You can't. You can't. I mean, I had a friend, he was from Saudi Arabia. I said, you know, could I visit you sometime in Saudi Arabia? And he just said, no, we don't allow Christians there. I mean, you could. And, and it's not safe. It wouldn't be safe for me to go there. And, and you can see the seeds of persecution here in the U.S. In the US. It's maybe not as full-blown, but it's more in the you know, education and, and different things like that. But the seeds are, are there. And the fifth thing is the gospel, you go back to Mark 13, 10, the gospel must first be proclaimed all nations. And so well, that's a sign of the end time that the gospel will be preached. Now, it doesn't mean that the gospel will be accepted by all nations. A lot of people will reject the gospel. But before the end, there will be a worldwide proclamation of the gospel. And so I would say right now, the gospel has a long way to go to make this happen. There's still a lot of people who have never heard uh, the gospel. Um, Wycliffe you know, they translate the Bible. They've translated the New Testament into 1,500 different languages. They've translated the Bible, the whole Bible, into 700 different languages. Um, but there's still a lot of people still who have never heard or don't have someone to tell them uh, about the gospel. Uh, all that to say, you, you think of these signs, and you can get really scared. Right? You can get really almost depressed and pessimistic about life, but Jesus' message isn't one uh, of fear. It's easy to get pessimistic when we see all these trends, when we see all these things happening. When you listen to the news, I mean, if you listen to the news all the time, you will think the end times are 
you know, everything's going to happen tomorrow. Um, it's okay. These things will happen uh, in the future. And when they do, don't be alarmed uh, by it. But, you know, Jesus is saying, be on your guard. Be alert. Keep watch. And, and here's the thing. When you see these, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one leads you astray when you see these signs. See, it's less about a date, but an attitude of confidence in God. It's less about a date when everything is going to happen, and more about an attitude of confidence in God. God's writing human history. Jesus will return one day. He will build his kingdom here. There's going to be a new heavens and new earth. We can be assured of that. Scripture says that. Uh, at the end of the Olivet Prophecy in Luke, it, it says this, But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life, and the day comes on you unexpectedly when Jesus returns. He said, Luke 21, 34, and 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. See, all the when we study Mark and, and Matthew and Luke and we study the book of Revelation, see, the golden question of, this, of it all for every one of us is, is an individual question. And, and that question is, are you ready? Are you ready? If Jesus came back today, are, are you ready? You know, have you... You know, we need the vision to see ourselves as God sees us, to see the urgent need that every person has to repent and to get our lives right with God. Are we ready? Are we ready? So that really is uh, the golden question uh, of this all. Let me pray for us this morning. Dearly Father, you are writing human history. Here Jesus is, is telling us the future. He's telling us a, a prophecy. He's telling us what's going to happen. And we can see those signs. And it's easy to get down about them. It's easy to get almost you know, depressed about them. But Father, um, we just have to remember to, to be ready. And, and to understand all this, these things. That they will come to pass. And, and what we need to remember to, to not be led astray. To, to keep persevering in our faith one day at a time. One day at a time. And Father, that, that when we're at the end of our lives, we, you know, and we meet God, He can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what it's all about. Those are the words that, that we want to hear. So Father, I pray for each individual here that if they're not ready, they haven't made, they haven't, um, made peace with God. They don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross that they would strongly consider uh, to get ready for when Jesus returns. And so, Father, I, I just uh, pray that for our church. I, I pray that for family members and, and people that are connected to our church. And, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, to be ready. In Jesus' name. All right, well, have a wonderful week and enjoy it.